Hi, this is, this is Gino Robert with GearWire at the 2010 AES in San Francisco, and I just happened to run across one of my favorite musicians of all time, Thomas DiMuzio, electronic musician, composer, mastering engineer, and uh, just all around swell guy. Tell us what you're doing right now. You got a lot of projects going on. Keeping busy. Um, in between mastering and the day job, uh, there's been quite a few uh, collaborative projects going on. Uh, just finished up some mixes with um, Voice of Eye, some studio tracks, uh, a couple projects with Dan Burke from Illusion of Safety, uh, two new studio based records, uh, Dimmer with Joseph Hammer, um, also is working on some studio material, and I have some solo stuff as well that, you know, has been on the hard drive for way too long, but I'm finally getting around to some of that. Uh, been playing the Moat guitar a lot, and uh, actually one of the solo projects is guitar-centric drone-based material. I'm pretty excited about that. Are and you playing all the instruments yourself? I am, and uh, a lot of, you know, I've been playing guitar for quite a while. Um, only recently have I uh, started to perform in public with it. Um, but for years, I've been using it in the studio to build slabs of distortion and, you know, undulating masses and things like that. And uh, so, yeah, it's nice to actually try to wrap up some of these projects. I've been talking with um, Aaron Turner from Hydrahead about potentially releasing it on uh, their label, which would be great because it's, you know, pretty much a metal label. And I, I think that some of this drone stuff is heavy enough, at least for uh, Hydrahead. We'll see. And would that be CD or would that be an LP? I'm hoping it'll be an LP, actually, because uh, I just feel it, it's, it's a better medium in general these days. That's what's moving. That's what the kids are buying, right? <laughs> now, when you, so you're recording, you're thinking, you're, I'd love this to be on LP, but are you recording it with that in mind in terms of like length of pieces and segues and things? Well, you know, length of, length of the recording is actually something you do have to keep in mind for vinyl. And, uh, but I don't consciously keep that in mind while I'm working on a piece. I might have to, you know, massage it a little bit after the fact in order to fit a particular medium. But for the most part, most of my tracks are under 18 minutes. Are you going back to cassette at all? I am, actually. Um, I was just, uh, I just sent a master this morning uh, to Band Productions, uh, AMK's label in L.A., and uh, he is, you know, he, well, he's never stopped, but he's back at it with cassettes. And he's got quite an impressive uh, series that he's been putting together. So, yeah, I actually have a cassette release after all these years. Is that a theme that he came to you with and said, here's, here's what I do? Or did you have a project that, that fit his, his aesthetic? Well, he had the, uh, the, the, the theme of the series. And I, he, I, a lot of folks that are part of the series have been doing this for you know, decades now. And uh, we're, a lot of them were part of the cassette culture movement of the 80s. And uh, so it might be themed in that respect. It's a lot of old school stalwarts, you know. Um, but musically, uh, completely open-ended, uh, you know, it was up to the artists, whatever they wanted to do. I wound up using a couple shows from uh, the Edinburgh Castle, uh, two different uh, performances there. I thought that maybe that was themed well enough for the release, but it's sounding pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it. And uh, it's funny, I just saw the Tube Tech booth over there and I, I recently picked up one of their, their mic pre, the MP1A. And uh, actually one of the, uh, the pieces for, from the Edinburgh, I wasn't so happy with. It was a little too uh, harsh. And even with uh, some of my outboard gear, I wasn't happy with the harshness, but running it through that mic pre was just incredible. It just smoothed everything out, and it made the recording just uh, a whole new thing for me, and something that I actually, you know, I'm engaged with now rather than shunning or thinking, well, could do better, you know. Cassette would do that anyways, right? Cassette will do that, actually. That's a good point. But um, the master uh, that, that I sent AMK is uh, just a WAV file. Um, so I, you know, I could anticipate that with the cassette, but it also determines on how the cassette's mastered as well, if he's going to do that hot or, you know, he's going to leave a lot of headroom or however he might do it. So that's in his hands, really, at this point. Is it, more, it seems like it's more complex now than ever in terms of trying to figure out not only where to sell the music, but how to distribute it and get it out there. It is. It's beyond. Um, so many small labels these days are, are suffering. It just seems that the, uh, the avenues for distribution are pretty scant, actually. 
uh, I was actually just rejected by IOTA. Um, yeah, wow. so that wasn't good for the ego, but um, at least for you know for this for fringe music like my own, uh, I think that the web uh, having a website is probably your best bet. It's a way to at least it's a mechanism, an avenue for release in my eyes. If you don't have another label that might be you know waiting for something, um, but at the same time, it's tough to um, you know sell your music through your website per se. So. Maybe you know giving away you know tracks and things like that is is the best bet, but yeah, distribution these days is is not like it used to be. Um, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, you could almost bank on the pre-sales of a record. You know, before you even released it, that record could be sold. I miss those days. Now, before it's released, it could be given away. Yeah, now we're just giving it away and hoping for a donation. Or maybe somebody will buy a t-shirt. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Gino. It's a pleasure. Good to see you, man. Likewise.